great. Thank you for having me here. Um, me and Ritu have not rehearsed. I'm going to touch upon many of the points that uh, Ritu talked about. And um, my opening thought is really uh, echoing what Ritu talked about, which is really the customers at the center of everything that we do, um, everything that we should be thinking about in the next coming years. Customer, uh, consumer, whatever you call him, never has the customer been uh, so important in the history of retailing. Um, originally, we used to think about a product um, around a customer need, and that drove sales. After that, we had um, service being the second uh, component which became in, um, important, and uh, after that, we had um, customer sales, services around that, and that drove sales. But today, the time is very different. The customer has taken the bait in from the hands of the retailer, um, and I think the future belongs to those companies that are able to um, understand this customer who's uh, taking this whole multi-channel uh, multi trend and uh, at the end of the day, seeking to get fulfilled across various platforms. Um, today are lagging behind because they've built their delivery mechanisms around a single channel as opposed to thinking about how the consumer wants to be fulfilled. So talking about you know, why we're gathered here today, I think the next five years are going to be the most exciting uh, for retail. There's a huge amount of interest we're seeing from strategic people. We're seeing a huge amount of interest from financial investors, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. But the best part about this industry is this is one of those few industries which has multiple beneficiaries. As you can see from this collage, you have farmers, you have manufacturers, um, you have the consumer, and all of them at the end of the day, if organized well, can be multiply um, reaping the benefits of this business. Um, the second most important part is this industry employs almost 8% of the population and contributes to 15% of the gross domestic pr uh, product or GDP. And I think it happens only once in the lifetime of an economy where the number of uh, entrepreneurs are less than the amount of capital. And today that's the thing with India. I think the number of entrepreneurs that are there are very few and the interest that we are seeing uh, many of the clients that we represent who really want to participate, um, whether it's private equity firms, it's institutional investors, strategic people, all of them basically find that the number of opportunities are less. But I think it has to be done correctly. Uh, the first phase of retailing showed to us that um, it's difficult, and again, I'll, I'll talk about um, that in the coming slides. But uh, in order to survive and in order to be able to monetize the value, I think investments need to be made in the um, right areas. Okay, so I think this is just a macro slide, really, which talks about um, the opportunity. Uh, you can see over here that the total retail market is almost close to 30,000 crores, and organized retail is a very small part, portion of that, that's uh, 2,400 crores. And if you go out to 2020, the projections is that this will be almost 72,000 crores a market uh, overall retail, out of which um, organized retail will be uh, 8,920 crores. I'm just converting the dollars into rupees. So really just a, a point to show that this is really a, a huge opportunity. Um, this is an interesting slide really, which um, talks about um, the opportunity. And the first slide is really talking about the penetration of organized retail in various countries. And you can see that uh, US is at the top of it and uh, India is at the lowest end, 4%, again, just demonstrating the potential that's there for organized retail. And uh, the second slide on your right is really even more interesting, which talks about you know, um, what penetration it has. And uh, to Raj's point, you can see that you know, uh, food and groceries is the biggest opportunity. It still continues to be very unorganized, and you know, that's the massive opportunity. I've got another slide going ahead, which also demonstrates this in a different way. But really, this shows that across the board, across various categories, the opportunities are huge in terms of uh, organized retail, um, the highest being clothing and uh, personal care. That's where the penetration is the highest. Um, this is a slide I'm not sure if all of you can see it or not, but I'll kind of read it out for you. 
Bailey talks about, um, this is a survey done by National Council of Applied Economic, uh, and they've basically done a survey which is around um, the annual household income and how consumption will be increasing. And you can see all the way they've defined from elite class all the way going down to you know, the mass class, um, how is the growth? And you can see from 2000, you have really a penetration of 2.3%, which is going almost 11%, all the way down to affluent, aspirers, and the mass. And you can see each category, really, in terms of household income, is not an increasing doubling, but actually they're almost growing more than three times. And this is just to show that consumption is only going to increase. And on the right side, really, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's talking about which categories are growing. And you can see food spending from uh, um, uh, 252 is going to go to 686 billion, and that's almost 2.7 times, which is really the lowest. And if you go all the way to the highest end, you have um, uh, basically healthcare, and you have education, leisure, um, housing, and consumer durables. All of these things are growing four times, which kind of shows that across the board, in any kind of retail category, there is huge potential. And I guess that's where the investment needs to be made. Um, we've heard a lot about the, um, the drivers and, you know, what are the opportunity in terms of, you know, economy booming and stuff like that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, I kind of try to sum it up in four main areas. I think first is foreign, uh, I mean, sorry, policy clarity. And I think retailing is falling, falling under two ministries. And if you can have a consolidated, you know, and have a single sector status given to this, uh, I think that would really help a lot. I think there's no agency which provides funding. You have SME funding agencies. So I think government needs to create some kind of a place where access to capital is there. Um, again, to Raj's point, uh, we've seen that across the board, retail is one sector where huge investments need to be made up front. So, um, and you need patient capital. And many times there's a mismatch in terms of the returns that you know, financial investors want and the actual realities of the business. So a single authority, um, um, clarity on FDI, the foreign direct investment, though there is on the 51%, but single brand versus multiple brands, I think hopefully you know, there'll be some clarity in the coming months on that. I think most important, um, nothing more can be said about the fact of uh, infrastructure, you know, still coal storage is still nascent. You know, one of the big challenges that we see is about transportation of fruits and back in infrastructure warehousing today. How many world class warehousing facilities do we have? So, some kind of a focus and some kind of a separate investment vehicle again to fund the infrastructure around there. Uh, talent pool again, it's a reality. You know, um, we've never thought about service being that important. So how do you train so many you know, people when you're deploying 8% of the population, which is expected to go to 12% of the population in a service economy? You know, it, it's a different scale we're talking about. And lastly, you know, funding. Can we create alternative sources of funding? And I've got one slide on funding, so I won't uh, spend much time on that here. And uh, for real estate, can you create asset light models where you know, the business doesn't own the properties? Recently, Tesco in the US just now took out their whole real estate piece and spun it off into a REIT um, to increase their profitability. So um, can we do that in India? So this is just uh, showing two kinds of uh, investors. One is a strategic investor, and you can see that uh, in the last five years, 13,800 crores of uh, strategic transactions have taken place, or mergers and acquisitions have taken place, and only 10 deals have been above 500 crores, which is very less considering the fact that everybody seems to be so bullish on retailing. Uh, we, trans we did a transaction at our company where we were representing Pantaloon, which was the, one of the largest transactions, um, the sale of that to Birla's. And again, it's a point of how distribution is important and how many times you don't need to be profitable in order to create value as long as you're hitting one of the value-creating drivers again, which is distribution being one of them. The other is the financial in, uh, interest. You can see only 9,500 crores of money has come into uh, you know, the uh, stock market in the retail segment, which is very less. But there is huge interest, and you can see that by trend, you know, the shareholder um, foreign holding going up from 9.5% to almost 15%, Titan going up from 10% to you know, almost 21%, Jubilant Foods, which owns the Domino franchise, going from 21% you know, to 48%. So across the board, there is huge interest um, in uh, uh, the segment. I think I slip, skipped a slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think this is a, a really uh, important slide.
What I'm trying to say over here in, on this slide is simple that um, a consumer wants to consume and he's going to take any mode that he needs in order to fulfill himself. And uh, in that fulfillment, I'm trying to uh, break down the understanding of consumer shopping and how do you define that? Um, if you break down shopping really, I think it begins at um, the desire to purchase, it moves on to research and comparison, it crystallizes itself at the point of purchase, moves on to delivery and then sales service. Um, in that whole thing, the consumer can choose to go online, offline, he can have delivery at home, he can have delivery in the store. He is really leading the whole revolution of how basically single channel moves to multi-channel and multi-channel moves to omni-channel. He's saying, I want to be serviced across the platform and I don't care how you've made your investments. Just because you've made your investments in a single channel doesn't mean that I need to be serviced that way. I need to be serviced across the board the way I want, whenever I want. Research is showing that the single biggest reason why people go online is not price anymore. It's all because convenience, you can shop 24 hours, a wide product range. So he's really leading the whole journey. And social media, which is right now only 3% of sales, is becoming a major reference point, is becoming a virtual showroom where people are going in, trying on clothes, they're sharing it, recommendations are being made to each other, friends. So it's really not a point of really sales, but it's really a place where recommendations, research is being done. Are we investing into this? So just thinking about those things. And it's not necessary that it has to be done only in clothing. I mean, if you look at two um, businesses, a restaurant chain in the US, which is Papa Jones, which is the largest um, uh, pizza joint, They've created efficiencies where they're serving customers online where you can actually see sitting at home, place an order, you get a table 30 minutes later, you go into the um, restaurant and in the restaurant actually your order's already ready and within five minutes the food's on your table. So it's not necessary that brick and mortar businesses like salons or, or restaurants at the end of the day have nothing to do with online or social media. So I'm going to talk about um, this. This first slide is about how do you make investments in your business which are non-financial, which at the end of the day culminate into value. So the first one was making you know, investments in an omni-channel net um, uh, presence, which is basically servicing your customer across platforms. The second one is um, talking about value creation through three other parameters, which is customer experience. When I talk about customer experience, um, I'm talking about the retailer's need to track how his customers are actually buying, how they're consuming, um, how they should operate their shop, I mean, their stores, how they should run their back end. And at the end of the day, delivering simply an experience that is consistent across channels uh, to the consumer. And lots of research is being done, whether it's in the store, franchise, shop in shop, and everybody who's successful is coming out with one universal finding and that is the more you know about the customer, the more deeper you go, the more successful you are. And if you take companies which are the most successful like Amazon, Zappos in the US, Virgin America, they've really just succeeded because at the end of the day, customers at the um, core of what they think. And I think the last uh, part of value creation is brands. We've seen globally, especially in the luxury industry, so many big brands don't make money at all, but yet they have a huge amount of value. Uh, I think in India we underinvest in our brands and um, going forward in the next you know, five years, brands are going to be very, very important in any kind of business that you do because brand is really the identification and as aspirations grows, um, we've seen in all developing economies, whether even it's eating, you want to be seen at the right restaurant, you, know, you want to be seen going to the right parlor, the right salon, um, not only the right clothes, uh, yeah, even in places like Sikkim, you have people who are wearing knockoff Nikes, you know, they're spiking their hair up. So you can see the younger generation is becoming very brand conscious. So how do we invest in brands? And I think it's okay to lose money when you invest in brands as long as you're seeing that the brand is driving sales. Uh, I promise you, you'll be able to monetize that value if your brand is amongst the top three or four in, in whatever you're doing. So uh, the third piece is basically um, branding being important. I'm just, I've just moved ahead a little bit, so, okay. So the question is, how do you fund, um, then the question comes is, okay, you're giving us all this advice, but then how do you fund the business? And um, I think that's very important. There are many traditional means of funding which are available, which are um, 
private equity, which you've heard about, you've talked about bank loans and all. But if you go to the US again, you have a lot of nodal agencies like GE being one of the largest, uh, um, GE Capital, where they've created an NBFC structure where they create leases. So are we thinking about you know, leasing our equipment? Are we thinking about discounting our cash flows? If you have orders from customers, can you go to a bank and say, can I discount this and can you give me some money against that? Um, can you basically go to um, uh, private equity firms or insurance companies? Insurance companies should, are really having long gestation capital. So can we use that money to bridge this gap that, uh, that retail industry needs, which is also a long gestation, and can we get capital from them? So finding new forms of capital, and not only that, finding new structures. Can we create mezzanine structures? Typically, why does it always have to be equity or debt? Why can't it be a combination of that where I take on debt right now at a lower cost of interest, I promise, say, 7%, 8%. And then over a period, as I start growing and doing well, I convert that debt into equity, which we call mezzanine financing in, financial, in the financial world. Can I basically create leases against my equipment, as I mentioned, against my store? Or can I basically, at the end of the day, give my property on uh, as a mortgage and then create liquidity for myself? So finding different ways to finance it. Um, and if you look at the life stage, I mean, I won't go much into this because each business has different parameters, but I'm just trying to make a point over here and demonstrate that your funding requirement, as you start thinking five, 10 years down the line, is based on what stage of the business you're in. And um, your decision on debt and equity has to be made based on your projections of your cash flows, which is very, very important. And as I start talking to a lot of the SME businesses, I find that really, um, uh, I, there's nobody really that's seeking that advice that what stage of my business I, am I at and then how should I fund it. People are just taking the capital that's available. If a friend comes in and says, okay, I'll put some money in, you pass equity. And then you realize by the end of the time when you're in growth phase, you're only owning 25% of the company. And that's not really a wise thing if you're in a business that's really growing. So how do you try to dilute the least amount of capital up front, fund it through debt, and then as the growth kicks in, then start diluting equity so that the owners, promoters really monetize value. And I think the, the, the last point is really, just uh, summing this up, is really um, take away, as you think about 2020 uh, retailing, d everything I think is gonna become digital. Digital is gonna become the main uh, enabling factor, whether you take um, social media, whatever you take, um, uh, mining consumer data, which is gonna become very critical, um, creating an uh, omni-channel network. Everything at the end of the day is gonna be based on your digital uh, strategy. Supply chain is going to become very, very critical. If you see today Amazon in the US, they're thinking about deploying drones uh, and they're investing in a drone company. They're waiting for uh, approval from the um, uh, airport authority where straight from the warehouse, your goods will be picked up from the drone right, and straight delivered right outside your doorstep, really. So supply chain is going to a completely different level. And um, finally, all of this uh, margins that people are going to save is going to lead to one change. And, this is a prediction, maybe I'm doing some blue sky thinking, um, crystal ball gazing. I think people are gonna go back to manufacturing again. Um, people have moved away from manufacturing and you have a formation of people who are the suppliers um, and then you have even McDonald's that is outsourcing most of its stuff from outside manufacturers. I think with the margin that people are gonna save, they're gonna do a full U-turn, we're gonna go to um, 360 degrees and get back into manufacturing again. And then once you're a manufacturer, the manufacturer straight through e-commerce, through digital technology, straight goes to the consumer. So that model of you know, outsourcing may change a lot and uh, you may have again investments being made in manufacturing. Uh, the third point you know, which, uh, which will be important you know, five years from now is new retail formats. Retail formats will no longer be just a transaction point, they'll be experience centers. They'll be places, if you go to the Apple store today, it's an experience center. It'll be a place where people don't necessarily go to shop, but just to experience products. And in everything that we do, even again, a restaurant, a salon, your pricing will be a function of what kind of an experience you can get in those places. Um, brand, I talked about that, but I think that's gonna become very, very critical, you know. Um, and I'll tell you why it's been a, becoming critical is because the last point which I've written, two extremes, I think there'll be a polarization that will take place. On one end, you'll have premium pricing and you'll see growth coming in those kind of areas where you can you know, command a price based on a brand, based on a promise really. And on the other hand, you have the low cost producers who will be doing really mass products and that will be again a growth area. Um, so you have basically the Mercedes on one side and then you have the Marutis on the side. I don't think the middle category is gonna grow. I think the middle category only grows on the body. 
you know, when you talk about a paunch or something. But I don't think anywhere else the middle category really grows and uh, um, investors are going to pay for people who are either on the premium side or who are really on the um, uh, extreme side. And uh, this is my closing thought again, uh, um, which is basically customers are important, people who don't put effort into understanding their customers, people who don't put effort into uh, mining and uh, trying to figure out what they want to be to that customers are people that are not going to really see too much of success. With that, I'll stop and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.